It's 5.30 here on Truman State campus, and welcome to TMN Television on Thursday, February 4th. I'm Lyndall Scotts. And I'm Laura Seaman. New tonight, Truman receives recognition for its campus safety. Plus, we look at how the Higher Learning Commission is changing teaching standards across the country. And after that, catch up on Truman Sports with our segment, The Dog Pound. These stories and more tonight on TMN Television. You don't want to miss this. Tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC, Democratic candidates Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders will engage in their first one-on-one -on -one debate at the University of New Hampshire. This debate is just days after the Iowa caucus, where Sanders lost to Clinton by only 0.2% of votes. During tonight's debate, the candidates will tackle issues such as super PACs, financial reform, and gun control. The next step for the candidates is the New Hampshire primaries, where Sanders is currently the frontrunner. MSNBC will also stream the live event on msnbc.com. The city of Kirksville hosted its annual State of the City Address on Monday. Each city department discussed three major accomplishments from 2015 and its goals for 2016. For the second time ever, Kirksville Regional Airport received a perfect score on its FAA Part 139 inspection, which examines the airport's operational and safety standards. City Council also honored Kirksville Police Department Officer Matt Kellison for saving a man's life by performing CPR. Department goals for 2016 include KPD obtaining body cameras for officers, replacing an outdated wastewater plant, and completing the downtown revitalization project. The Truman State Theater Department won three design commendations January 17th at the Region 5 Kennedy American College Theater Festival in Minneapolis for its production of The Nether. The commendations went to senior Maddie Chambers for lighting design, theater professor Dominique Gleros for costume design, and theater professor Ron Ribkowski for scenic design. Four members of the theater department attended the festival, including Chambers, Professor David Charles Goyette, and seniors Lexi Diaz and Francis Kemper. A festival correspondent nominated Diaz and Kemper to participate in the festival's Irene Ryan Acting Scholarship Competition. Coming up, a Truman alumna returns to her home college to encourage students to pursue their dreams. But before that, let's take a look at this week's forecast. A redhead <gasps> staring contest. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. All right, you ready for some baseball trivia? Let's do it. What year produced the most no-hit games in the big leagues? Seven no-hitters in 1990. Wow, that's right. Now a question that's not trivial. How many children will witness bullying this year? Huh. The answer, three out of four. 75 percent? That's wow. right. How many of them will say something? Kids want to help, but don't know how. Teach them how to stop bullying and be more than a bystander at stopbullying.gov. The Higher Learning Commission has new standards for teachers across America. TMN reporter Bethany Boyle has the story. Starting next year, the Higher Learning Commission will implement new standards for teachers of undergraduate and graduate level courses. The HLC Board of Trustees revised guidelines in June, saying instructors must have a master's degree, or completed 18 graduate level hours in a subject to teach it at the undergraduate level. This includes high school teachers who teach dual credit courses. 
Truman Institute Director Kevin Minch says the regulations are fairly new coming from the HLC, but are not new to Missouri. He says the state is setting similar standards, requiring Missouri teachers to comply with the education requirement before the HLC policy takes effect. A state policy was supposed to be enforced starting January of this year, but has been pushed back to January 2017 because high schools across the state expressed concerns about meeting the new standards in time. Kirksville High School principal Randy Michael says Kirksville's dual credit instructors already meet the new standards, but some smaller schools may opt to reduce dual credit offerings or pursue online alternatives. Michael says the main issue is that students who receive dual credit are prepared for the next level of college coursework. And I can see where it might be um, um, impact some schools who are limited on staff, uh, but also appreciate the effort of those um, um, higher ed folks to ratchet up the expectations from dual credit so it's just not an easy way out because you're not doing kids any favors by just giving them credits to take on to, to college. So. The HLC policy says these new standards must be, imp be implemented by September 2017. In December, a national list recognized Truman State for its campus safety. TMN reporter Jasmine Adams has the story. Back Backgroundchecks.org recently ranked Truman State as one of the safest colleges in the nation. Truman ranked 32 out of a list of 50 schools based on information from the U.S. Department of Education and the Office of Post-Secondary Education. The Department of Public Safety contributes to the security of campus both day and night. Officers walk through selected buildings on campus at least four times per day and respond to emergency calls after hours. DPS Director Sarah Holzmeyer says Truman's main crime concern is theft, but the department takes a proactive approach against this and other problems by encouraging students to stay alert. I send emails out quite frequently about safety issues on campus and things like that. Um, I also stress the importance to my officers about getting out and being seen on foot in the residence halls and the academic buildings. Um, a lot of times with officer presence being, being part of it, um, just the perception that we're out there uh, deters a lot of crime. I recently had the opportunity to ride along with DPS officer Nathan Goodwin, who says the department goes through several types of training, such as the active shooter training he took part in this past winter. Goodwin says the department requires officers to walk around campus and through at least four buildings per day. He says officers keep students safe by watching out for them from their patrol cars, inside the campus buildings, and even from rooftops. Nationalists frequently cast Truman in a positive light. For example, in 2015, Truman was ranked number one for best cost with a quality education among other public universities in the nation. Admissions Director Melody Chambers says Truman's recent safety ranking will be a helpful resource for parents and potential students and will be added to the department's records. However, Chambers also says she wants to remind students that while these rankings reflect well on the university, it is also important to find a school that fits the students' individual wants and needs. Um, in the end, what's most important is them getting connected to people that are here on this campus and feeling um, a sense of whether or not this is an environment where they're going to be happy and successful. That's what the foundation of an admission or a, a decision to enroll should be. And, and we use the rankings and we promote them from that perspective so people are well informed about um, what is available, but it's never something we'd say you should choose this because of. Chambers also says living in a smaller town like Kirksville is a factor in campus safety when compared to schools set in larger cities. In addition, Truman's DPS and Kirksville officers frequently work together, creating a safe environment for students on and off campus. For the Truman Media Network, I'm Jasmine Adams. Truman State alumna Christy Ann Greyer spoke at Truman's Women and Gender Conference in Ophelia Parish Thursday. Truman invited Greyer to speak at the event because Greyer's company, Clutch Productions, commissioned a play focusing on women that was also written and directed by a woman. Along with two actresses, um, Greyer talked about how they came up with the play, and they also encouraged Truman students to pursue their goals. Greyer says that they were pleased with the questions that the students asked and were happy to create connections with the students. It's not that they are just like, oh, we want a job. You know, it's, it's that they're asking because there's something that they're eager to learn and share and there's suddenly like an opportunity that could be available that they didn't think. Those interested in learning about the current state of the Middle East were given the opportunity on Thursday at an open panel discussion hosted by students for Middle East Peace. 
The event featured lectures from five student volunteers covering topics such as the rise of the Islamic State group, the roots of the Syrian civil war, and the current migrant crisis in Europe. The discussion also included information about the political positions of US presidential candidates in regards to Middle Eastern issues. Students for Middle East Peace President Senior Caitlin Best says her organization wanted to put on an informative event that would be relevant to students. This year, we are not a part of the Global Issues Colloquium, but we still wanted to have that presence here on campus. Um, and we also took this as an opportunity to branch out into other conflicts in the region. This year, obviously, the conflict in Syria and Iraq has been a really big news item. And so that's what we decided to do our panel discussion on this year. Bess says she hopes students will apply the information they learned at the event when they go to vote in the upcoming presidential election. After the break, stay tuned for our sports segment, The Dog Pound, hosted by Sarah Hicks. We'll be right back. <laughs> Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. This is an oven. And it's hot. Not microwave hot. Oven hot. This is made from scratch. The Bacon Swiss Chicken Biscuit. Only at Hardee's. Hey Truman State, my name is Sarah Hicks and this is The Dog Pound, always brought to you by Hardee's. This past week I sat down with Amethyst, Truman State's competitive winter color guard, as we discussed their first competition and what it was like to bring home a victory. Let's take a look. Since we're a beginning guard, we started in Regional A, Independent Regional A. Um, and since this was our debut um, into MCCJ, which is Mid-Continent Color Guard Association, it was a little nerve-wracking. We weren't really sure what to expect. Um, we were competing against two other guards, uh, Mosaic and Majestic, and we ended up beating both. We were five points ahead of second place and ten points ahead of third place. For our first competition out, uh, that was our first time competing in MCCGA, so that was a really big you know, confidence builder for our first competition right out of the gate. We got first place, so that was really good. We have nowhere to go but up now. But Amethyst is so much more. It's, it is the showcase of the flags, the talents used for like spinning the weapons for it and like artistic um, expression and everything with this type of art form. Marching band like you do, you have your giant football field to work with and everything and we aren't like kind of cast aside because what they do with the flags normally is just like you're going to just be like a nice accent to the music and to um, the design of like the field but um, with this we are like the only thing there and so we've got to showcase all the skills that we've developed over the season. Thanks for tuning in this week. As always, I am Sarah Hicks reporting for the True Media Network and this has been the Dog Pound. Before we end our show tonight, we would like to welcome TMN Digital Director Senior Ingrid Retchen to the studio. Ms. Retchen and 27 other students went to Iowa this weekend to report on the ca caucuses. We invited her to come share her experiences at the Iowa caucuses. Welcome, Ingrid. Thanks for having me, Lyndall. So, Ingrid, can you explain to the viewers what exactly the Iowa caucuses are about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the caucuses for Iowa are kind of like the primaries that we have here in Missouri, except for they run a little bit differently. Um, it depends on whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat how you vote. For the Republican caucuses, each candidate typically has a representative who stands up and gives a speech about why you should vote for that candidate. And then afterwards, there's a round of secret ballot voting. And then those ballots are later counted to decide who wins the caucus for uh, Iowa. For the Democratic caucuses, though, they run a little bit differently. There's uh, usually everyone gathers in a big auditorium or a gymnasium. And precinct leaders representing different candidates um, stand in different parts of the room. And the people who show up to vote then move to those parts of the room for the candidate that they want to vote for. 
Uh, so it's based off of body, co body count rather than based off of a ballot vote. Um, what's interesting about the way that the Democratic caucuses work is that uh, you get to listen to a lot of like debate and discussion between the people who are there talking to their friends or their family, trying to convince them to come to one part of the room or the other. Uh, sometimes the precinct leaders will also bring like cookies or cupcakes to give to people who end up voting for their candidate. So it can be really fun to watch that exchange take place. Um, Another really interesting thing about the Democratic caucuses is that if a candidate doesn't have 15% of the votes inside of the room, they're considered unviable and you can't vote for that candidate any longer. So for example, a lot of people were expecting O'Malley to not reach the 15% viability mark, which at the caucus that I attended meant that he would have to have less than 73 people in his corner of the room. He actually ended up having over 100, so he ended up reaching viability. But had he not, those people who were voting for him would have had to move to a different candidate and vote for either Hillary or Bernie instead. Wow. It sounds like a really hectic place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How was the media treated when you guys were there? Uh, well, it really depended on what rallies you were attending as media, um, how those candidates chose to treat their, the media who were there to cover the events. Um, as student journalists, it was really interesting to watch because we were right up there with the other journalists from BBC and CNN and AP, um, right mixed in there with the crowd. Uh, for going to rallies like uh, Bernie's rallies, they typically had a lot less security. People really didn't care if the media went out into the crowd to take pictures or interview people. It was a lot more relaxed. Um, obviously, for candidates that had like Secret Service accompanying them on their campaigns, things were a little bit more uh, tight. You had a little bit more restrictions on you. But the tightest restrictions that we had uh, for any of the candidates whose rallies we attended were definitely for Donald Trump's rallies. Um, once you checked in to the uh, rally as credentialed media, they put you in this little bullpen that had kind of like gates around it, and they stationed campaign managers and police around the edges. And once you were in there, you weren't actually allowed to leave this bullpen and go interview people or take pictures of anything. Uh, so it felt very restrictive, kind of uncomfortable. Um, maybe a little bit unconstitutional. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how I have really felt about it, but it definitely was not a good place to be. <laughs> so did they differentiate between international, national, local, or student media while you were at the rallies? Um, as far as the way that the media were treated, not really. Um, if you were a student journalist, a local journalist, you were all put in the same spot together. Really the big difference came for a lot of the international journalists that we had talked to, people who had come from different parts of Europe and other parts of the world to come cover the Caucasus since they do have such a big impact on the rest of the world. Uh, we actually spoke to a lot of international journalists at some of these events who said that they had had a lot of trouble getting into um, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton's rallies. Uh, which was really interesting that they had been denied credentials to some of those events. Uh, some people said that it may have been because they weren't as concerned with international media covering the event and wanted to have national media who were actually going to get the message to their voters out. Um, other people said that they just had issues with international media coming in and covering their events because they didn't like the things that they were saying about them. Um, but that was really the big difference in the treatment of media that I saw with the international journalists. Yeah, I guess each candidate has their own agenda. Mm -hmm. um, did you get to meet any of the candidates while you're there? Um, I unfortunately did not get to personally meet any of the candidates or interview them or ask them any questions. Um, a lot of the time they gave their preference to the uh, national media who was there with the big cameras who they knew were going to put them on live TV. So our group didn't really get to interview a lot of journalists. Uh, what was interesting was the only candidates who we were really able to get up close to and take pictures of and maybe ask a couple of passing questions here and there were the smaller candidates like O'Malley, like Santorum, like Huckabee, like O'Malley. Um, those candidates we were able to actually get up uh, close to them, talk to them, take pictures of them. Um, so that provided a more intimate experience, I think. Did they act any differently, you think, um, than what you saw them on TV? Uh, you know, 
it really depended on the event and what was going on. Uh, Marco Rubio is a lot more charismatic on person than he is on TV, surprisingly. Um, and the Donald Trump rally that we attended, he actually, most of the time when you see him on TV, he's yelling and shouting and being really emphatic. But he just, at the rally that I attended, just really didn't have that much energy, I guess. Um, he had been on the road for a really long time, and the caucuses were about to come to a close, so maybe he was just tired. But um, towards the end of the rallies, I noticed the candidates kind of maybe started losing some steam. <laughs> So what would you say was the most surprising experience for you at the caucuses? I don't know if there was any one experience that was surprising to me, but I think the thing that was most interesting or shocking to me was the fact that no one really cared if we were student journalists or if we were national media. Once we were in the media bullpen, we were the same as all of the other journalists. And it actually gave me a little bit more confidence knowing that people were treating me with the same respect or disrespect <laughs> as some of the other media outlets that were there. Uh, people didn't care that we were just small student journalists from the middle of nowhere, Missouri, writing for our small student newspaper. They really wanted us to either take pictures of them and interview them and get their story out there, or they wanted us to leave them alone. <laughs> So I guess for me, uh, the most encouraging and also kind of surprising thing was just that it didn't matter that we were student journalists. We were just part of the media group while we were there. Nice. Well, thanks for joining us, Ingrid. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Well, and that brings us to the end of our program. Be sure to check out our exclusive web content at tmn.truman.edu. And for weekend updates and special coverage, Look for TMN Television on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And for complete multimedia coverage, be sure to pick up a copy of The Index and tune in to KTRM on 88.7 The Edge. From all of us at TMN Television, thank you for tuning in and have a great rest of the week.